With the brain and most tissues in the body, their structure and function is directly proportional to the demand that you place on them. We also know that if you increase cognitive activity or cognitive stimu stimulation later in life, you can then change the slope of decline. Cognitive function seems to track with the change in demands that we place on our own brains. Can we change this trajectory um, with something like CrossFit? I think we can, uh, and I'll give you a few examples of why that is. Hello, uh, so, so fabulous to be here today. Um, normally when I stand on stages like this, there it's at dry academic neuroscience conferences, and it may surprise you to know that you are way more engaged and way more jacked than a typical <laughs> neuroscientist. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Um, my lab uh, focuses primarily on brain injury, uh, ways to treat brain injury in babies, ways to treat concussions and other traumatic brain injuries, and then uh, uh, how we might improve cognitive function later in life. Um, I do have some paid scientific advisory uh, positions in uh, digital health and sports performance, but none of that will affect what I talk about today. I always also think it's important to talk about our personal biases and my own philosophical conflicts. Um, and so the first is that I believe age-related cognitive decline and dementia are largely preventable. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and my second uh, personal bias is that I really like lifting weights. <laughs> and hopefully by the end, you'll uh, believe that it is, uh, you can have biceps and a brain, and ideally you will have both. So this is what we're talking about today, and you may have seen graphs like this before. And when Dr. Lyon asked me earlier, when does Alzheimer's disease start, uh, you can see that for most cognitive functions, they start to decline in the 20s and 30s. So you could say this is when Alzheimer's disease potentially starts. But there is a bit of a split. So along the top there, you see something called crystallized intelligence, which is basically remembering you know, who you are and sort of traditional facts. That stays pretty stable. But everything else pretty much declines linearly from when we get into our 20s or 30s. So uh, you see things like short-term and long-term memory, processing speed, reasoning, executive function. Those things tend to decline with age. But when we see graphs like this, what happens is we then internalize them in some way like this. So you can see age along the bottom there. You can see cognitive function. Um, and then you might think that early in life, our cognitive function increases. And it does. It tends to peak around the time that we finish formal education. Um, and then after that, it's just an unstoppable decline. And you know, maybe eventually it will get so bad that we end up with dementia. And if there's anything we can do about it, um, it's just to make it worse. So maybe we get really stressed. Um, you know, maybe like me, we come here, get some jet lag, we don't sleep very well. Um, maybe we're at a conference and somebody puts on a nice VIP drinks thing, like last night we drink too many cocktails. Um, and all we can do is just accelerate this decline. However, what we have started to realize is that this is not uh, the natural state and this is something that can be largely prevented. Even big, dry, dusty academic institutions like the American Academy of Neurology, this is a position statement from them last year, they said the era of uh, preventative neurology has arrived. So we can start to prevent these uh, neurodegenerative conditions right now before um, they, they take hold. So then we might think about what are the risk factors for cognitive decline. And this is a very nice uh, meta-analysis from Professor Yin Tai Yu where uh, him and his team looked at all these different risk factors across the entire lifespan. So um, as you go up the scale from one above the dotted line, those are things that increase risk, and anything below the line decreases risk. And you can see a whole bunch of things there that you might uh, find familiar. So we have sleep disturbance at the top, depression, stress, cardiovascular disease. Below, we might have like physical activity, uh, cognitive activity, education. All these things we know are protective. We also know that if we have multiple risk, risk factors, then our risk increases. So this is a nice study where they looked at cognitive function tests of um, 22,000 individuals, and then they counted uh, these different risk factors. So you can see things like hypertension, hearing loss, head trauma, smoking, depression. And each line um, represents how many risk factors people have. And you can see the more risk factors you have, the lower your curve. So you start lower, and then uh, you end up uh, with some kind of significant dysfunction earlier in life. And so what ends up happening is we see these endless lists of risk factors and things we should address. Here's just a typical one that I took from social media. 
Um, and these are quote unquote evidence based. So this is um, maps pretty nicely onto uh, this list that came from a fancy journal, The Lancet, uh, looking at all these different risk factors uh, for Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline. Uh, but this is quite a short one. Sometimes you'll find a list of 40, 50, 60 things that you're supposed to try and address. The problem with this is that it doesn't really give us a system to think about how we might start to work these in. So it is important to say first that prevailing opinion now suggests that cognitive decline is modifiable and preventable. Some people say that anywhere between 40% and 75% of dementia are preventable, and we have a large number of risk factors. However, I think it's, we, we need some kind of system to understand these. Um, often we think we have all these different risk factors, and if we just address them one by one, then we can have this outsized effect. But we know that uh, risk factors don't stack on top of each other linearly. Um, I'm not going to give you a statistics lecture, but we know that lots of things interact. So omega-3s are really important for preventing cognitive decline, but they're only important if you also have good B vitamin status. Those things, you need both. You can't just have one or the other. Um, so we need some kind of hierarchy to understand how these things fit together. So, I'm going to provide you with a possible solution. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the demand-driven theory of age-related cognitive decline and dementia. Uh, like most uh, new theories and approaches, in order for it to catch on, we need uh, a catchy acronym. Uh, <laughs> well, we're, we're working on that. Um, but to really simplify it and so that a meathead like me can understand it, I'm going to tell you why your brain is like your biceps. So this is uh, the general principles of the demand model. We have three main things, or three categories of things that are important for brain function. The first is cognitive demand. So cognitive activity, social activity, how we actually use our brains. Then we need supply. We need supply of nutrients, supply of oxygen, uh, supply of metabolic substrate, be that glucose or lactate or ketones. Um, and then we need to support uh, these adaptive processes so that we have a healthy uh, neural substrate. Uh, so that's sleep, stress tolerance, and avoiding toxic exposures like alcohol or smoking. And um, this is how it might work for your biceps. So um, your demand, you lift some weights, and then you get more jacked. Um, but if you want to optimize your jackedness, then you probably need adequate protein. We heard about that earlier. You probably need some micronutrients and you need some rest and recovery. Um, and I will argue that the brain is exactly the same. So what you see here, uh, you know, you can have uh, a, the perfect amount of protein in your diet, you can sleep a bunch, but if you don't lift weights, then you don't get jacked. Um, <laughs> with the brain and most tissues in the body, their structure and function is directly proportional to the demand that you place on them. Uh, this idea, I've developed uh, with Dr. Josh Turknett, who's a neurologist, so everything I talk about today is, is absolutely uh, due to him as well. Um, and we published a paper on this uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and what we talked about was how we need to stimulate our brains, and the, the process of stimulating our brains then upregulates all these things that we talk about in terms of longevity, like autophagy, mitochondrial function, um, and then for, for that to then adapt to that demand, we need some recovery process like sleep, which is when neuroplasticity and all those connections happen. Uh, but the most important thing is we need to challenge the brain first. So some evidence for this. Um, one of the best ways that you can increase your cognitive function across the entire lifespan is getting a longer education. Like I said earlier, your, your cognitive function peaks around the time that you finish formal education. Um, and these are data from a meta-analysis where they looked um, at all the different studies, and basically, the longer you spend in education, the higher your potential for cognitive function. That doesn't mean you can't change it later in life, uh, regardless of your initial um, uh, education. However, that gives us the highest peak. And you can see here that those on average with higher education, they have a higher trajectory to start. And even though their rate of decline is similar, they then reach that point of uh, dementia, that sort of functional threshold where you can't look after yourself in the same way later in life because they started from a higher point. We also know that if you increase cognitive activity or cognitive stimul stimulation later in life, you can then change the slope of decline. So this is a study where they looked at 2,000 uh, middle-aged adults in the US, and then they followed their executive function, which is things like decision-making um, over a nine-year period, and they found that those who increased their cognitive activity had a slower rate of decline compared to those who didn't. And this is very simple cognitive activities like reading, word games, lectures or courses, and writing. 
We also know that a whole bunch of risk factors are important. We talked about that earlier. So this is um, uh, another paper where they, you know, they didn't give you a list this time. They gave you a circle. Um, but you'll see all these things like blood pressure, community engagement. We'll talk about that some more. Uh, food and diet, glycemic control. And what they said is that if you have these things in place, then you can push out the time that the de decline starts. So for those, th those three things that we talked about, you can increase your peak earlier in life. You can slow the decline, both with cognitive stimulation, and then if you have the right environment, um, you can slow the point or push out the point that decline starts. And then eventually, uh, you may get to the point where you might, decline you might decline a little bit later in life, but you don't get to the point where you have significant dysfunction. And this was kind of um, put together in this paper now uh, 15 years ago by Herzog et al, where they basically said that each of us has this broad range of possible function across our entire life. So we each have our own individual curves, like you can see here, the gray shaded line. But the things that we do, the things that we engage in, and our lifestyles and environment, they can move us up and down this curve. And we have a huge capacity for change at any point um, along the lifespan. So this is kind of. Uh, uh, a summary of, of the demand model. You can see uh, we talked about cognitive demand, so learning, skills, coordination, social interaction. And then those things directly drive brain structure and brain function. But in order to support those processes, we need supply of nutrients. We need uh, good physical health, metabolic health, as well as things like sleep and avoiding um, significant toxins. However, in order to really get this process going, if we don't have demand, we won't see significant improvements in brain health. So I'm going to give you some more direct evidence for this model. Um, and the brain, just like the muscles, are highly trainable and highly adaptive to the processes that we use to train them. So we know that you can create very, very specific functions if you train it the right way. However, there might be a trade-off. So if you wanted to be a super heavyweight powerlifter, you wanted to deadlift 1,000 pounds, you might not be a very good marathon runner. The brain is essentially the same. Um, we also know that if we use broad cognitive stimuli, we use lots of parts of the brain at the same time, then we have functional carryover into other things that we might care about, like our decision making. Uh, but if we remove the, those stimuli, just like if we stop training, then we'll get less jacked over, over time and our brains will, will function less well. So this is an example, um, one of my favorite papers, uh, where they looked at people who were learning to become taxi drivers in London. Um, Back in the day, if you wanted to drive a taxi in London, you had to gain something called the knowledge. The knowledge is being able to navigate 25,000 streets in a six-mile uh, radius circle around Charing Cross Station in downtown London. Um, they looked at people who trained for this and managed to pass the test. And then they had non-qualified trainees. So these are people who trained, and they trained for about three years, but then failed. And then they looked at a control group. In the group that managed to pass, they saw significant changes in the hippocampus, which is this important part um, of the brain that, that we use uh, for, for memory function. They could see this on MRI scans, but they didn't see those changes in the two control groups. However, these uh, guys got so good at navigating London that they got less good at other cognitive tasks. So they did this other uh, task where they had to remember this figure here, the Taylor complex figure. They showed them the figure. They had to learn it. Half an hour later, they have to remember it and draw it out they actually got worse at that. So you can get really good at one thing, but then the brain starts to get less good at other things, just like um, our physical bodies. This is another study where they taught people how to juggle. Um, and what they looked at was changes in the gray matter of the visual cortex at the back of the brain. And when you're juggling, the thing that is the greatest demand is tracking all those balls in space. Um, and so when they managed to learn a three ball cascade here, uh, you can see from scan one, that's a baseline scan two, that's changes in the back of the brain um, after they've learned how to juggle and they stop uh, juggling. Uh, three months later, you start to see some of those changes reverse. So we can see these very specific adaptations in the brain to a specific stimulus, but we remove that stimulus and the brain starts to change back. We also know that if you want to maintain a specific function, you need to keep practicing it. So this is a really nice study where they looked at expert and uh, amateur pianists. Um, the experts were taken from these internationally renowned uh, 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 piano consortia. Uh, and they looked at young individuals and older individuals. And what they found was that those who were older, they had slightly slower uh, processing speed overall. This is in a, a test called the digit symbol substitution test, which I'll also talk about again later. Um, however, when they looked at uh, a skill-related, a piano skill-related task, 
the, old, the older individuals who were experts were just as good as the young experts. And what, what predicted their ability to perform the test was how much practice they'd done recently. And actually, age had nothing to do with it. So on the left-hand side, this kind of is similar to the, the graph that I showed earlier. But now, uh, rather than talking uh, necessarily about specific functions, we're talking about specific networks in the brain. So the, the brain is normally structured in these very highly organized networks that have specific functions. And as uh, we age, as our cognitive functions decline, these networks become less stable. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can see networks are related to processing speed, reasoning, memory, numeric and spatial abilities. And this is a nice paper um, that came out recently that basically said if you want to maintain these functions over time, what you need to do is stimulate them. That's what you can see on, on the right-hand side. Related to this, and this is also related to Dr. Palmer's talk, is how are we getting energy into the brain in order to maintain these tasks? So some of you may have seen a picture like this. Uh, this is taken from a PET scan. What you do is you give uh, individuals a labeled or set of glucose molecules, and then you see how much is getting into their brain. On the left-hand side, that's a normal uptake, so lots of glucose is getting into the brain. And then as you get into mild cognitive impairment and then into Alzheimer's disease, less glucose is getting up into the brain. And traditionally, people have thought that this brain is insulin resistant, that glucose can't get in. Um, but actually, uh, this uh, quote comes from a, a much more recent paper that says, the resting state FDG PET does not distinguish between a reduction in the availability of glucose, so is the brain insulin resistant, or, or reduced demand. So if you're trying to look at, say, glucose going into, into a muscle, if somebody is sedentary, um, is it that that glucose can't get in because they're insulin resistant, or is it not getting in because the muscle isn't asking for it because it's not doing anything? Um, and interestingly, I apologize for the very long quote, but this kind of says it all. Uh, these are data taken from uh, Stanley Rappaport. He was at the NIH in the 90s and 2000s. Um, and what he found was that during cognitive stimulation, regional glucose uptake, so glucose getting up into the brain, and blood flow can increase to approximately the same extent in mildly demented Alzheimer's patients as in controls. Thus, early in Alzheimer's disease, energy availability due to reduced brain blood flow is not rate limiting for function. Therapies at this stage should be designed to reestablish synaptic integrity or prevent its further deterioration. So basically, we need to stimulate that brain, and it can take up glucose. The reason why glucose is not being taken up uh, into the brains of people who have early stage Alzheimer's disease is because they're not using those parts of their brains. So if that brain gets stimulated, it can still take up glucose just fine. Another example of removing stimulus and how it affects cognitive function is retirement. So for most people, our, our jobs from day to day, they provide most of our cognitive stimulus. Uh, we know that those who retire later experience cognitive decline and dementia later. So on the left-hand side, this is data taken from a complex statistical model. But basically, what they did is they imagined if we pushed out the age at which everybody retires, you can see that along, along the bottom, then this effect on cognitive function increases. So the longer we can get people to stay uh, active and at work, the greater the effect on their cognitive function. But then if we said that everybody suddenly retires at 68 years old, then cognitive function starts to drop off. And we see something similar in studies when we look at the age of retirement, particularly those who uh, retire later have a significantly uh, decreased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And that's after you adjust for things like medical conditions that might make you retire earlier. So going back to uh, the study by Herzog I mentioned earlier, when they talked about the things that it will take to move ourselves up towards the top of our own personal cognitive function trajectory across our life, they mentioned three critical variables. So the top one is enhancing the functioning of the neural substrate, nutrition, physical exercise. These are the things that you know, uh, people uh, in, in this room, you and I, uh, tend to focus on. Uh, but they said two other critical things were the level of cognition itself, so how are we using our brains, and the larger context in which an individual thinks, learns, and remembers. So how are we then taking those cognitive functions out into the world and using them in the context of others? And so these are the critical components of a demand-driven cognitive function model. So uh, to kind of think about how this might look, I've, I've, I've made this, uh, this graph of neural, um, neural demands, uh, how we use our brains, the sort of demand that's put on our brain throughout the typical lifespan. So um, I go back uh, to the beginning. I work a lot with neonates and, and the, the, the very early developing brain. Um, and you'll see that like, learning to walk, learning to talk, social interaction, these are incredibly challenging processes. Uh, that are really, really difficult on the brain, but that's what drives our early brain development. 
We do that, um, and then we get into our teenage years and we learn how to drive, and that's difficult, but it's not as difficult as learning how to walk. Um, then maybe you go to college, you learn biochemistry, you learn the Krebs cycle, and that's difficult, kind of boring, um, but it's not as difficult as learning how to talk. Uh, then we go to work and we do the same thing again and again and again and again. And um, we may think that we're challenging our brains because we feel stressed and we're busy, but it's not the same thing. We're not challenging ourselves in the same way as we, when we first learn social interaction and how to interact with other people. Then we retire, we lose that last little bit of cognitive stimulus that we had. And then we think, oh, well, I retired, so I better do a little bit of Sudoku um, to, to stimulate my brain. And you know, maybe it makes a little bit of a difference, um, but probably not much of one. So in reality, uh, cognitive function seems to track with the change in demands that we place on our own brains. It's very, very high in childhood and then much less in adulthood. If we think back to those original graphs, um, is it that our function declines over time, or is it that we just use our brains less over time and then function follows? So um, I adapted this graph a little bit for this talk. And <laughs> I did wonder whether, like, regardless of where you start to do it in your lifespan, can we change this trajectory um, with something like CrossFit? I think we can. Uh, and I'll give you a few examples of why that is. So uh, some important parts of why uh, CrossFit may help really support the demand model for long-term cognitive function particularly coordination and skill development, um, maximal use of muscle groups and improving relative strength, so how well we move our bodies in space with things like body weight movements. I'll talk a little bit about aerobic fitness and strength, and then we've heard several times today about social connection, and I think that's also really critical. So um, I mentioned earlier that multi-domain skills have carryover. Um, this is a study where they took individuals who were in their 70s and they gave them a very, very simple resistance training protocol, three sets of eight reps on six ex exercise machines two times a week for six months. Um, they saw that those who were in that resistance training group, and this was a randomized controlled trial with other groups, but those who were in that um, lifting group, they had in, uh, significant improvements in cognitive function, uh, global cognition, executive function. Um, and in particular, when they looked at follow-up studies, this um, protected these white matter tracts. White, white matter is this part that like, six, uh, sits under the wrinkled cortex of the brain that's responsible for these really fast connections between regions in the brain. And par parts of the white matter that are at risk in the aging brain were particularly protected from this resistance training intervention. And large meta-analyses um, have shown this too, and we're actually uh, uh, working on writing an, an updated paper for looking just uh, at that, including uh, Dr. Lyon, if, if she's in the room. So we're excited to get that published. Um, I mentioned relative strength. This is another paper that we published um, last year. Uh, and so what we did is we took data from uh, NHANES, which is a large population cohort here in the US. These are all individuals uh, largely in their 60s and 70s. Um, and I mentioned earlier that I don't think that these things are linear, right? The brain is more complicated than that. So I did this kind of statistical model where there's a network. So I can allow for all these different factors to interact. Um, and you can see lots of things around there. We looked at physical activity. We looked at inflammation, uh, homocysteine, which is a marker of B vitamin status, HbA1c, um, blood pressure. Um, you'll see the first. And then so if there's any line between um, two dots, that means there's a statistically significant relationship. And then the thickness of that line tells us about how important that relationship is. Um, and you can see, kind of like I mentioned earlier, um, the education was the strongest predictor of overall function. Uh, but then of all the other factors, the next most important thing was what we call relative force, which is how strong are your legs relative uh, to the rest of your body. And that's after taking into account everything else. I will just briefly mention that the, the um, the test that they use is here. It's the digit symbol substitution test. I mentioned that earlier. It's a, it's a test of working memory and processing speed. And what you do is you get um, no, uh, symbols that are, that are associated with numbers. And then you get numbers and blank boxes underneath. And you have to write out all the symbols. And you have, there are 133 of them that you have to complete in two minutes. So you have to do more than one a second if you want to do really well on the test. So you have to like, work pretty quickly. Um, we also know that exercise has a bunch of other uh, important cognitive benefits. So this was a study where they looked at emotional resilience, uh, individuals who either exercise regularly, and it was a pretty low threshold, just uh, more than once a week, versus those who didn't. 
And what they did is they then put them through the trier social stress test, which if you don't know what that is, you have to get on a stage like this and then they tell you, you have five minutes for a job interview, you have to pitch yourself to the job, go. Um, and, people, and then the audience just sits there passively and gives them no feedback whatsoever. So it's very, it's, and then you have to do some mental arithmetic on the spot as well, again, while people just like sit there and stare at you. Um, and so it's very stressful. Um, and what they found was that after this stress test in those who exercise regularly, they had smaller changes in, like negative changes in emotions. They were more emotionally resilient, it was less emotionally stressful to them. And this is in line with something called the cross-stressor adaptation hypothesis, which basically says that small doses of one stress, in particular exercise, increases your resilience to other stresses. So this is then a randomized controlled trial that tested that hypothesis. They took uh, engineering students, and half of them were just a control group. Uh, the other half were given an exercise, an aerobic exercise program uh, for 20 weeks. And it was a pretty simple program. So you're taking people who are completely sedentary to start with, and they were doing 30 to 60 minutes of alternating walking in zone two. So something like super, super simple. Um, and then they had a stress period, which was their exam period. Um, and what they found was that at baseline, so at night, uh, as you might expect, those who did aerobic training, they had improved heart rate variability. That was their outcome measure. But then during the day, during the exams, that effect was even bigger. So when they got stressed during the exams the next day, those who'd been doing um, aerobic training, they had less of a heart rate variability response to that stress. I mentioned at the beginning that one of the reasons why I think CrossFit is particularly good in the context of the demand model is because of the skills that you learn, the skills-based uh, movement, body weight movements, gymnastics movements. Um, and at the top here, uh, these are data from uh, big meta-analysis that looks at all these different kinds of physical activity and how they affect cognitive function. And they found that coordinative exercise was the one that had the biggest significant impact on, cognitive, on, on cognition. Um, and what we've generally seen across the research is that the open skill sports, um, and I've given some examples there like badminton, table tennis, gymnastics, dancing, these seem to have a, a greater benefit on the brain than uh, a unimodal like cycling or running, training, even, even if they're matched for the intensity of the physical activity. And there are a few different reasons for this. Uh, one could be that the kind of uh, the challenge of trying to orient, orient us, ourselves in 3D space that accelerates these processes of neuroplasticity. Um, we also see increased risk of, uh, increased release of neurotrophic factors, and that could be because of the type of movement, or it could be because you're using more total muscle groups. But in general, these kind of uh, complex movements seem to be even better for the brain. So this is a nice example that came out recently. Um, this was a crossover study, so everybody did both, and then they compared the responses. And what they did is they looked at um, uh, these neurotrophic factors, like brain derived neurotrophic factor. You heard about that from Dr. Patrick this morning. Um, and they had them run around a 400 meter track uh, for an hour. Uh, that was sort of the, the normal uh, control group. Uh, but then they did this enriched version where they had to like, it was the same track, but they had to run around cones, or they had to jump over stuff, and then they had to duck under stuff. Um, and what they found was that both conditions increased BDNF release, but this was about two to three times higher after they did the more complex version than when they did just the simple running around a track. Um, this uh, is a study uh, in kids, so nine to 10 year old kids, um, and they randomized them either to uh, regular running or running drills for 45 minutes three times a week, or to motor skills. Uh, so you can see what that included, playful balance, bilateral coordination, uh, exercises including balls, skipping ropes. Um, I don't know if this was wall balls and double unders, um, but, you know, I like to think it might have been. Um, and then they looked at performance in a digit span test, so this is a working memory test. Both groups improved compared to a, a sedentary control group, but the benefit was significantly greater in the kids who did these sort of complex motor skills compared to the kids who just ran. Um, another one of my favorite studies, uh, this looked at older adults, uh, and they randomized them either to uh, dancing, uh, twice a week for 18 months, or a sort of endurance type activity, which is sort of matched for how intense it was. Um, and what they saw was that while both groups improved, uh, they looked at structural changes in the brain, and these were greater, like more benefit in the dancing group uh, compared to the running group. And this, you know, mul multiple reasons why this could be, you're doing it, it's more social, uh, there's more uh, motor skills involved, uh, but despite the same sort of physical stress, 
um, dancing uh, were, were, had more benefit. We also know that uh, how fit we are aerobically in particular improves how adaptive our brain is to new stimuli. So um, this has been particularly looked at in the motor cortex. Um, and it's, this one study is kind of complex, so I'll kind of talk you through it slowly. So there's, um, they took individuals who are either um, particularly lower body endurance athletes, so runners or cyclists, because they wanted to look at plasticity in the upper arms. So they didn't want it to be like um, confounded by, by the, the type of exercise that they did. And they compared them to sedentary controls. And these are high volume endurance athletes. So they're doing um, you know, 12 plus hours of uh, aerobic exercise a week. And what they did is um, they have this uh, measure of uh, muscle activity down here in the hand. You can see that sort of at the bottom left there. Um, and they can measure the contraction in, in that muscle. They then put a mag, uh, this mag magnet over the motor cortex. And um, it's this really strange procedure, which I've had done to me. It's kind of weird, where you, they give this magnetic pulse, and then over the, the part of the motor cortex that controls this muscle, and then this muscle twitches. Um, and what they then looked at is how quickly the brain responded to this new stimulus. So you can see just below that where that waveform is, um, you can, it, the gray one is when you just stimulate the motor cortex with the, with the, motor, with the magnetic pulse. The black um, wave is when you first give uh, this small kind of conditioning stimulus at the wrist, uh, at the nerve which goes into that muscle. And what they saw is that those who were more aerobically fit, they see this much bigger adaptive response to the second magnetic stimulus than do those who uh, were in the control group. So what this basically says, and there are now dozens of studies that show this, is that um, aerobic fitness in particular seems to mean that our brains are more plastic. They're more adaptive to these novel stimuli. We've heard several times today about uh, social environment and our physiology. And uh, a colleague uh, of mine and I, uh, Dr. Julian Abel, we just uh, edited this large uh, special edition of uh, a scientific journal that looked at the effect of communities on health. Uh, one of the authors was uh, uh, Dr. Julianne holt Lundstad. She led the Surgeon General's um, uh, study and report on uh, social isolation. But another sort of a key paper that came in this special issue was here from George Slavich and colleagues um, there at UCLA. And they've really sort of um, dissected what happens when we're socially isolated. And this has been mentioned several times today, but essentially when you're socially isolated, you upregulate this pro-inflammatory, stressful uh, set of, of, of responses. And actually it's a survival response. So evolutionarily, if we were isolated by upregulating these factors, we actually, um, we have better wound healing, we're more likely to survive. But if this is upregulated long-term, then that's associated with increased uh, metabolic and heart disease, depression, anxiety, and cognitive decline. So we know that those who are socially isolated have an increased risk um, of dementia. That's what we see on the right hand here. This is from a very large meta-analysis. And we also see the opposite. So those who have good social support, good social engagement, they have a significant decrease um, in uh, dementia risk. And what's interesting is if you look at how the brain changes when you're socially isolated, it looks like what happens in cognitive decline and dementia. So on the left-hand side, uh, you can see this is from one study where they look at regions of the brain that atrophy or shrink uh, when you're socially isolated. So you'll see things like the parietal cortex there in orange, the prefrontal cortex in red. That's where we, we sort of um, do our executive function, our decision making. Uh, we have uh, the temporal cortex in blue. And underneath that, you can kind of see inside is the, is the hippocampus, which is in green, which is, which is uh, significantly affected in Alzheimer's disease. And then if you look on the right-hand side, um, that's uh, uh, trajectory of changes of, of brain volume, which uh, the size of the brain over time uh, in Alzheimer's disease patients, and these map onto each other almost uh, perfectly. So to kind of uh, summarize how CrossFit uh, can fit into the demand model and support long-term cognitive function, um, there's uh, an inherent uh, drive for skill learning, a huge amount of social support. We've talked about that a lot today. Uh, direct neuromuscular stimuli, so that can be from the type of exercise, resistance training, as well as uh, complex movements. Um, we also improve supply, so vascular health will improve with aerobic fitness. We're probably going to get better nutrients if people start following uh, the, the, the typic, uh, typical nutritional guidelines, even though I didn't talk about that much today. 
Um, as you exercise more, you're probably going to improve your sleep. We already talked about improved stress resilience. Um, and as all of that comes together, um, improved fitness, social support, you're going to get decreased stress and inflammation, which is then going to uh, sort of decrease those breaks on our long-term cognitive function. And that's going to give us our more jacked brain, which is <laughs> what, what everybody wants. So finally, we're going to come back to the point that I made uh, at the beginning of the talk. And you know, I, I thought for a long time, I, I had this bias that you know, maybe bigger muscles will also give you a bigger brain. Um, and I finally found proof in this paper that came out uh, just over a year ago. And this was actually buried in the supplemental material. I had to go like hunting around for it. Uh, what they did is, this is from the UK Biobanks, this is about 350,000 people. They looked at all different parts of body composition and how it relates to dementia risk. So at the bottom, there's this thing called arm fat-free mass ratio, which basically means how big are your guns relative to the rest of your body. Um, and then the higher that goes, the, the lower your risk of dementia. And there's like no upper limit, um, which, is, which is nice to see. <laughs> So I think we're all familiar uh, with these like, central tenets of CrossFit. Uh, but in order to like, fully support long-term cognitive function, I'll make one edit. Um, <laughs> which will then bring us to our summary. So hopefully, I've made the point that the majority of cognitive decline may be preventable. Um, brain function and health, I believe, is driven by cognitive demand. And this is then supported by other lifestyle and health-related metabolic factors. Um, your brain has some control over its own destiny. It's not this thing that just like, sits in your skull and you do bad things to it and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, and if you can take away, one, take away one thing from this talk, please go and learn a skill, particularly something that you suck at. That first uh, foray into something that you're not very good at is really where the magic happens, and obviously, preferably with some friends. Um, so to kind of tie that back to CrossFit again, I've uh, butchered uh, 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 the CrossFit in, in, in 100 words, the fitness for cognition in less than 100 words. You've seen this several times today. Um, regularly learn and play new sports uh, routine is the enemy. Thank you very much. <laughs>